Somebody's Luggage, a collection of themed short stories by Charles Dickens and other Victorian writers. Eminent London headwaiter Mr Christopher has discovered and purchased a mysterious set of luggage that had been abandoned by its owner in the private hotel and dining establishment where he works. In specific items of the luggage, there is a set of handwritten papers, each containing a story written by the luggage's owner, who is known only to Mr Christopher as somebody. Episode 6, Discovered in His Hat Box, Part 2 of the story of the obliging Mr. Blorridge by Julia Cecilia Stratton. When Mr. Blorridge woke the next morning, he was reminded by a slight headache that something unusual had occurred, but he came out of his cold bath as lively and fresh as if he were the combined essences of two or three dozen Mr. Blorridges. However, turning round, he encountered the chair and suddenly remembered its fatal property. Oh, what am I to do? How to get rid of it? Should I send it away? Lock it up? Bury, burn or destroy it? Yes, I will. <laughs> Lady Verita? It is of no use, Dick. This chair was not enchanted merely for your whim. Sit down and listen to me. Lend me your watch, Dick, to sit upon. Yes, ma'am. Oh, oh, oh. Do excuse me. Now, Dick, how naughty you are. You do not use my gift as you ought. Why were you thinking of burning my chair? Simply because it had done its duty in enabling you to see people as they really are and know their thoughts? But I do not wish to know them. My dear Dick, infinite wisdom has given you susceptibility, intelligence and reason. You only use the first. Reason should step in and enable you to make practical use of susceptibility and intelligence. Do I make myself understood? I know I am a fool, but let me reap the fruits of my lack of wisdom. I would rather be foolish for life than untrap others into sitting into this chair. Dick, you require a lesson. Use it well, be patient, be submissive, and all will end well, both for you and me. Adieu, Dick. Be wise and prudent. Dick's first essay at being wise and prudent made him hand his female visitor at once into the post of honour, the Chair of Truth. She was Gatty Bland, a pleasant girl who he had met once or twice at Dr Evans, the medical man of the neighbourhood. He had the general idea that she was the 23-year-old daughter of an invalid widow and the eldest of a flock of healthy-looking children to whom she acted as foster mother, owing to the physical inabilities of their real mother. He had so far noticed Gatti as to admire her eyes, soft and brown, the exact colour of her hair. I had not noticed how really pretty you are. Mamma has sent me here this morning, Mr Blorridge, to beg your acceptance of the loan of a beautiful china bowl. There is not another like it in England, and she fancied it would be just the thing to hold your trifle tonight. I thank her very much. But how does she know I was going to have a trifle tonight? Oh, we know it very well. You give a ball tonight, and from our house we can see the lights and faintly hear the music. Then, if I accept the loan of the beautiful china bowl, I must ask a favour in return. I will promise to perform it, Mr Blorridge, for I feel sure that you will not ask anything that I may not promise to perform. I am proud to be so trusted. I should wish to beg the favour of your company tonight to see how well the trifle looks in the beautiful china bowl. Oh, I wish I could come, but we are very poor, and Mamma is too great an invalid to take us out. We shall find much pleasure, though, in watching your gaiety from our window, and delighted to think that our china bowl has helped to ornament your supper table. Mamma has had great pleasure in watching the building of your house, Mr Plorridge. She said a good man is to inhabit it. 
And a good man always benefits a neighbourhood. Your mamma is very kind. Mamma is very good, Mr. Blorridge, and I ought to return to her. And so, your mamma is glad to have a near neighbour? She is glad that you are our neighbour. She thinks that the sunshine of a good man's heart may sometime fall upon her poor children in the shade. Oh, so it shall, my dear, please God. But, Gatty, you must marry. Oh, would you like to marry? I don't know, Mr. Blorridge, but I fear few will care to marry a, a little plain girl with a turned-up nose and a heart full of her own people and who wants a nomination well, Have you for... ever seen anyone you would like to marry? Only one. And that is you, Mr. Blorridge. Oh, goodbye. I must run all the way home. Poor dear thing, that I could have been so base and dishonourable as to ask her such a delicate question when I had so many safe ones to ask. Gracious heaven, that I should have dared to put so preposterous a question and receive such a... such a... Such... <laughs> but it's very pleasant to be so undeservedly appreciated, to be liked and loved for one's own sake. She is pretty, very graceful. She flitted out of the room like a bird out of a rosebush. Her nose certainly turns up, but I believe there never was a silly person known with the turned-up nose. I wonder what the nomination was that she wanted. That evening, Mr. Blorridge led out the, in those parts, highly renowned and celebrated Lady Fitz Cluck to open his ball with an old-fashioned country dance. Who is that? Oh, my word! There is the chair of truth. How did that get there? I have never in my life witnessed anything like it. A stately old lady now occupied the chair, encircled by a crowd to whom she was holding forth in an extremely uncomplimentary fashion. With his responsibility staring him in the face, he hurled Lady Fitzcluck through a narrow gorge of dancers. Oh no, I'm... Very sorry. An unfortunate button on his coat had entangled itself in the lace of a lady's dress, and Dick now danced, trailing a long, tattered shred in his wake. Oh, Fanny, I am most terribly sorry. Oh, do not worry, Mr. Blorridge. Dear, lovely Fanny, what an angel. Oh, how terrible. The damage to your dear love of a pretty dress, Fanny. Oh. Let me pin it up for you. Thank you, Florence. Oh, and the lovely Florence. She too is an angel. Meantime, all eyes were now attracted to the horrible old lady, sat like the personification of a gorgon in the chair of truth. Oh dear, I could no more dare ask her a question than if she'd be the devil himself, arrayed in gorgeous female attire. There she must sit until fate steps in with three questions and releases her. As he looked hopelessly to the door, he saw the little piquant nose of Gatty Bland. She went towards the chair and in her plain white dress conveyed the lady, all purple and gold, down the room and out of the door into the tea room. Oh, bless you, Gatty. As soon as he was free of Lady Fitzcluck, Mr. Blorridge flew to seek a new dance partner, either Fanny the Fair or Florence the Beautiful. But they were both together. Oh, no! In the chair of truth. Fanny on the cushioned seat, Florence on the stuffed arm. Florence was still employed in pinning up the tatters of Fanny's torn dress. There, dear... I have pinned you up and done the best I could for you, dear. Oh, but I am so glad to see, notwithstanding, that you are a monstrous figure and not fit to look at, dear. Oh, thank you, Florence, dear. <laughs> oh, you are a false thing. I see through your meekness and affectation, as if you do not care about your dress. It's a pity Mr. Blorridge can't see you at home. It's a pity Mr. Blorridge can't see you at home. Aunt longs for the day when she can rid herself of you, indolent, selfish and useless creature that you are. 
But Aunt comforts herself with the reflection that she has not such a firebrand in the house as you are. She can well afford to put up with a little indolence where there is so much good temper. <laughs> it is better to be a little passionate than sulky, love. Is it love? Mr Blorridge is the best judge of that. We all have our tempers and you don't expect a perfect wife, do you, Mr Blorridge? Oh, I am very imperfect myself. Oh, no, Mr Blorridge. You are everything that is nice and good-tempered. And this is such a love of a house that no one could be unhappy here. You would always be cross and fractious, Fanny. And you would always be rude and boisterous, Florence. You are a shrew and you know you are. Oh, you are a hoyden and you know you are. I am ashamed of you, my darling. I am disgusted with you, my precious. Ladies, ladies. She has the vilest temper, Mr Blorridge. She can't speak a word of truth, Mr Blorridge. Oh, throw your handkerchief to me, Mr Blorridge. No, throw it to me. Mr. Blorridge, to me, over here, to me, throw it to me, please, throw it to me, Mr. Regent, please, throw it to me. Florence, Fanny, music, lights, flowers, dancers, Lady Fitzcluck, and the old lady all suddenly disappeared. Picking himself up, there was nothing near but the chair, overturned, and an empty wine bottle. Oh, thank heaven! It must have been a dream. Yes, of course. But a very bad dream. Gently, he restored the harmless-looking chair to its proper place. Shall I remove the thing, sir? It's close upon nine. Do so, Penge. There is coffee, sir. I think I will have a cup of coffee. Rather strong. Yes, sir. What a relief not to have to see Penge sit down on the chair. Ah, it's a delicious cup of coffee, Penge. And it so perfectly agrees with me that I think I'll take a run over to Dr Evans and play a game of chess. The sharp night air hit him with sudden giddiness and every twinkling star appeared to be closely embracing a twin star that twinkled with still greater vigour but he soon got over these delusions. How good of the night to be so fresh and fine! How kind of the stars to beam down on me so brightly when I am a man full of evil and weak thoughts! I harboured a design against my fellow creatures of the basest sort, and to add to my crime, it was directed against one who I meant for a wife. True, I know nothing of Miss Fanny and Miss Florence, but I'll make it my business to see more of both, and I'll try to be guided to a right choice at last. Blorridge, do come in. Now, this is friendly. I've had a very anxious case which has caused me much worry these past three days. It is happily past the crisis now, and I was just saying to my wife how I should enjoy your stepping in. Well, I'm heartily glad I came. Of course you are. You are always kind and seasonable. When were you ever otherwise? Dick followed the voluble and hearty doctor up the stairs and into the presence of Mrs Evans. But Dick was unable to acknowledge Mrs Evans' cordial greeting by so much as a single word. For there, before his eyes sat on a little chair by Mrs Evans' side was Gatty Bland, her face peeping out of a handkerchief tied over her head and under her chin. Uh, you know, dear little Gatty, of course. She's waiting for her mother's medicine. I hope you've given Gatty a cup of tea, my dear. Of course, my dear. Dick sat down and awaited with the calm composure of a victim of fate for Miss Bland to offer him the use of her mother's beautiful china bowl. But she did nothing of the sort. In the ensuing half hour, though the conversation turned upon no other subject than the approaching housewarming, she made no allusion whatever to china or bowls. 
Dick was half sorry. It would be so agreeable to thank such a charming girl. If her mother had let me the china bowl, I'm sure she possesses one, then I might have called to thank her. I wish to become more intimate with the family. Perhaps I might be of service to them. Was there anything or nothing in that nomination she so nearly talked about? He invited Gatty to the housewarming and anticipated her request for Jenny and Albert. He was not at all surprised to find that she had a sister Jenny and a brother Albert. But it did surprise him to see how pretty she became when she smiled her thanks. The very thing. A little gaiety does more good than all my pills and potions. Mr Blorridge, my dear, very thoughtful. You'll expect all four, I dare say. Three girls and a boy. Only four, I expect eight at least. But Mrs Evans, one of us must stay with Mamma. I will do so. My dear, I will see to that. I will step down in the morning, Gatti, and settle it all with Mamma. And tell Mamma from me that I shall spend a couple of hours with her tomorrow evening. I want to study her case and I shall like a rest between your dances, Blorridge. That is that you two are most kindly going to represent me for that time. Just so, my dear. What, what, are you you off, Gatty? Stay. We'll send our man Mike with you. The railway has brought a lot of ill-looking people about recently. Let me take you home, Miss Bland. Oh, thank you very much, Mr Blorridge. We will have a game of chess when you come back, Blorridge. When he returned to the game of chess... It is certain that Dick was in a romantic mood and willingly listened to the long history of the Blands. Miss Bland spoke of a nomination. No, by the by, she didn't. It was a china bowl. Dear me, what do I mean? I think I hardly know what I do mean. You look rather wild, Dick. I don't know what you talked about on your walk, but there appears to me to be no affinity between a nomination for the Blue Coat School and a china bowl. Oh, that's what she wants, is it? Blue coat school. God bless my soul. Really? A nomination, eh? Blue coat. Check to your queen. Notwithstanding the check, Dick lost the chess game, but he went home in such a happy state of mind that he felt as if he had won. Blue coat school. Blue, 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 blue nomification. Mr. Blorridge arose in a contented and happy frame of mind the next morning. The great day was the greatest of successes. Nothing marred the triumph of the dinner or the beauty of the ball. The hard-faced old lady sat in the chair, but she was just as forcible and disagreeable as usual. No more and no less. Dick danced with Lady Fitzclark and spoke with Fanny, Florence and Gatty, for Gatty was there demurely happy. Florence looked most beautiful, charmingly dressed in white tarlatan. Fanny was dressed in floating robes of blue with fair curls twined with silver leaves. However, Mr Blorridge was able to listen to both girls and learn much that was of interest to him. Miss Bland's muslin dress is rather plain, don't you think, Mr Blorridge? And it's real ivy in her hair, so they can't have gone to any great expense to do honour to your ball. I like them all the better for it. I am so astonished at the impertinence of such people as the Blands, Mr Blorridge, thrusting themselves into society that is... So much above them. Hmm. Mr Blorridge accomplished his dances with Fanny and Florence. But at the instant that he claimed Gatty's hand, Dr Evans returned from taking care of Mrs Bland. Oh, Mr Blorridge, I must go. Thank you so much for the happiest evening I've ever spent. No, no, you must not go. A quadrille takes only 20 minutes to dance. But Mamma is alone now. And I should be quite unhappy for all that 20 minutes, even though dancing with you. But there is Jenny. She dances so well and loves it so much. And don't think me conceited, Mr Blorridge. She is so pretty. 
She is the prettiest girl in the room but one. Dick assisted Gatty to put on her cloak and looked at her with unspeakable admiration as she tied the little handkerchief over her head and under her chin and he longed to clasp her there and then to his heart. But instead he flew back to the ballroom. Oh, Mama! I saw kind Mr Blorid asking Jenny to dance and Jenny looked as pretty as those two cousins, Florence and Fanny. They say Mr Blorid is to manny one of them. But I hope not. I see a good deal of them here and there, and I am sure they are only pretty girls. They do not appreciate his kind and generous heart. One morning, soon after, the post brought a piece of news that fairly surpassed the excitement of the housewarming for the Bland family. A nomination to the Blue Coat School for one Master Albert Bland. Meantime... Mr Blorridge divided his time pretty equally between his little office at the bank and the houses of Dr Evans, Florence's father and Fanny's aunt. All these visits, combined with the still existing effects of his dream, ended in consequences. The first consequence occurred to Dick's brother, the profligate and self-satisfied William. Billy! What exactly do you do with the sums of money that you are forever borrowing from me? Uh, Well, um, you know, expenses and and the like. In future, I expect such sums to be repaid. Here is a ledger containing a debtor and credit account between us. Have a look. To Mr William Blorridge, the sum of £10, £20, £25, £35... Oh, my gosh. What, 40 pounds? 45 pounds, 60 pounds. Oh, dear. Oh, my word. This ledger displayed a state of account so alarming to Mr William that he reformed, rather, and applied, in sober seriousness, for the post of junior of all junior clerks that he had previously so despised. The second important consequence... Mr. Richard Blorridge committed a piece of extravagance. He commissioned for himself an extravagantly expensive statuette in white marble. It must be ethereal, with extended wings and lightly poised on one foot. But above all, it must have a slightly turned up nose and a little lace handkerchief under the chin. On New Year's Eve, ten years after the conclusion of these events, Mr Blorridge is in his dining room. Dinner is over. Wine and dessert are on the table. The fateful magical chair is at the upper end of the room with, above it, the lovely statuette on a carved oak bracket. Dick is reading the paper alone. Come in, my lovely little ones. How are you? What have you been doing? Mama prepares their dessert. There is a chair missing at the table. Let me sit down in this one. Papa, Papa, Mama is in the chair of truth. Then let us question her. Mama, are you happy? Happy as angels are said to be. Do you love us? As my life. Gatty Bland, have you ever repented marrying Dick Blorridge? Oh, never, ever. (laughs) (laughs) All's well that ends for Mr Blorridge, Gatty and their young family. But will all end well too for Mr Christopher, recipient of the luggage and all the stories in this series? To discover Mr Christopher's fate, listen to the seventh and final part of Somebody's Luggage.
In The Obliging Mr. Blorridge, episodes 5 and 6 in the Somebody's Luggage series, Mr. Richard Blorridge, Dick, was inhabited by Ed Clark, with narration provided expertly by Lisa Nightingale, who also gave us a highly indolent Florence. Richard Vince was suitably spoilt and petulant as Billy, Mr. Blorridge's brother, as was Ellen, Mr. Blorridge's nearly fiancé, who was rendered in true spirit by Emma Willits, who also took on the part of the fiery Fanny. Jim Newberry was Penge the butler, and S.J. Vant gave us a practically perfect Lady Verita. Last, but very much not least, Gatty Bland was rendered in all her goodness by Hannah Newell. All other parts were played by members of this cast. The episodes were adapted, produced and directed by Jim Newberry, with all sound and effects engineered and created by Robbie Burgess. They are a joint venture between Revenge FM and Uptick Productions. <laughs>